Brothers and sisters, welcome to Zion Hill Baptist Church. We're at 6175 Camelton Road in the city of South Fulton. I'm your servant, Aaron L. Parker. We are so very grateful to God that you have made the decision to share with us on today, especially on today, for this is the day on which we celebrate our 149th year of existence here in Atlanta at Zion Hill Baptist Church. And so my brothers and sisters, we ask that you would be called to worship on this special and glorious day. The psalmist said, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is God's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made so let us rejoice and be glad in it. God bless you and God keep you. We urge you brothers and sisters to stay with us throughout this day, even all the way to the benediction, for we have something special for you throughout this entire service. And now Deacon Marilyn Cruder will lead us in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this day. God, we come to you with a humble and grateful heart. And God, we come to you with a hallelujah on our lips and in our spirit, because you indeed have been good to us down through the years. God, we thank you for 149 years in the Zion Hill Church family. God, we thank you for all that you've done down through the years, showing your grace and mercy and your faithfulness. God, we thank you for those that have come through this, this church, those that are present now, and God, we thank you for those that are yet to come. We thank you for being good and merciful to us. God, we thank you for our pastor. We pray that you keep him strong and continue to be a guide and a shepherd for us. Bless his family and all those that are around us. God, we thank you for just loving us and keeping us and knowing us, God. We know that this day you know each and every one that's praying with us at this time. God, you know situations. You know who has a broken heart. You know who is bereaved. You know who is sick. You know who is depressed. We know you know who is despondent. But, but God, we know that through your faithfulness and all the things that we've been through, we know who you are. God, just help us to remember, just in our own lives, God, help us to remember how many times you've been a comforter, how many times you've been a healer, how many times you've been a way maker. So God, just help us this day to remember so we can continue to say hallelujah and thank you, God. God, we know that your love and your kindness is unfailing. So God, just help us as a church body to continue to be believers, continue to be workers, continue to be servants. And in this, we ask in Jesus' holy name, his powerful name, that we come to you. Amen.
my brothers and sisters, there is power in the name of Jesus. As the name of Jesus has been called upon now for 2,000 years, people have come to know and understand that there is power in that name. Praise God. And now my brothers and sisters coming to share with us is the chairperson of our 149th church anniversary, Minister Jairus Hallams. He will come now with the occasion and with a special recognition. Minister Hallams. Great morning, Zion Hill. It is great to be with you this morning as we celebrate our 149th anniversary. It is a pleasure to serve as a chairperson again, and it is indeed a great honor to be uh, along with all the great members and ancestors of Zion Hill Baptist Church. I just want us to reflect for a little bit and think about all of the presidents who have served the United States since 1872, all who have come and gone, but guess what has still survived? Zion Hill Baptist Church. Let's think about all the kings and queens that have, have been in our textbooks and in our history books over the years and think about how they've come and gone, but Zion Hill Baptist Church has still been here since 1872. Let's think about all of our people who we've looked up to some family member, some celebrities, whomever is, has been impactful on your life, how they've come and they've gone, but God has been carrying Zion Hill since 1872. And so with that in mind, we ought to give God the praise that he has been faithful, that he has been never failing, that he has given us this hope that has endured through 149 years. And so while I could go through the long, extensive history that God has blessed us with, I'd rather just allow us just to meditate just for a few seconds on all that God has done for Zion Hill, all that God has done for us through Zion Hill, and what God will continue to do for us and this city through Zion Hill Baptist Church. And now I would like to honor our members who have served for 50 or more years at Zion Hill Baptist Church. These are some members who have been raised in the church, who have volunteered and served and ministered to this city and to the broader community. And now we just want to take the time to honor those individuals.
Yes, indeed, my brothers and sisters, this is a glorious day. And we do indeed celebrate those who have labored here at Zion Hill for over half a century. We thank God for you. Most intensely, you are the foundation upon which we have continued to build, but not only the foundation, you continue to put your shoulders, your hands, your thoughts, your prayers into the furtherance of this ministry. Thank you, and indeed, let me thank every member of Zion Hill, for without you, this fellowship would not be what it is today. God bless you and God keep you. Now, my brothers and sisters, we would remind you of just a few congregational and community concerns. Again, we continue our fight against this world pandemic called COVID-19. We are continuing our testing program. Now our testing program will be on Thursdays from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m., from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. Testing now is more important than ever, given that new strands of the virus are, are among us. So brothers and sisters, please be diligent. Testing once again on Thursdays, even this Thursday on August the 19th, from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. You see the information, how you might register? We ask you to please do so. But if not, come during those times anyway, and you can get tested. Also, our vaccination program continues here at Zion Hill. We are vaccinating every Tuesday and Saturday, Tuesday and Saturday from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. Vaccinations, Tuesdays and Saturdays from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. Brothers and sisters, we are looking forward to you coming and getting a vaccine. And I know that there are brothers and sisters among us who still have some hesitancy or, in, or are in some ways convinced that Vaccines are not good for us. Brothers and sisters, I would just plead with you, listen to those who know, or at least those who know more than we know. And you have to ask yourself the question, what really are my choices? And what do you really believe? Do you believe that over 600,000 people in this country alone have died from this disease? I'm just asking whether you believe it or not. If you believe that, if you don't believe it, then there's not much I know that I can say to you. But if you do believe that, and if you do believe that those who are contracting the virus, particularly the Delta variant, are primarily, we're talking about over 90%, are those who have not been vaccinated. Those who have not been vaccinated. And brothers and sisters, don't be like the brothers and sisters who have to go to the hospital first, be on a ventilator, and then start to ask for the vaccine at that time. If you are still up and in reasonably good health, think about it, don't wait. Just pay attention to what's going on. I'm not saying this because I hate you, I'm trying to destroy you, or even that I think that I am misguided. And you wanna know what I'm doing? Yes, I'm listening to scientists who have studied infectious diseases for decades. That's who I'm listening to. So brothers and sisters, I urge you, just listen, just hear. And it may be, it may be an action that can save either your life or the life of a loved one. Our children's church and 
13 Chapel will not take place today. We just invite everyone, the whole church family, to join with us in our celebration of the 149th church anniversary. But Children's Church and Teen Chapel will commence again next month uh, on uh, the uh, third, second, and third Sundays of next month. And we urge all of our youth and children to please join with us. Again, brothers and sisters, we are so glad that you have come to celebrate and to have this time with us. On yesterday, we had a tremendous time. I will talk about that a little bit later. But we uh, passed out a number of dinners, wonderful dinners, wonderful dinners. And we have just a few of them left, just a few. So we ask those of you who did not get an opportunity to come by on yesterday to pick up your meal, your anniversary meal, you can do so today between 12 noon and 12.30. I'll say that again. Between 12 noon and 12.30, you can come and pick up your meal today if you did not come on yesterday. We'll be looking forward to seeing you. Mind you, we only have a limited number that are left. So brothers and sisters, if uh, you did not make it, you can come and share in that experience. Again, I wanna urge everyone to make sure that you stay with us throughout the entire service. Stay with us all the way to the benediction. All the way, we have something special we want to share with you later on. So be with us all the way through to the benediction. Don't get up, don't go away. And we want to share something with you. Now, my brothers and sisters, the time comes for our tithes, commitments, and offerings. Just as God has blessed you, we ask that you would share just a portion of what God has given to you that we may go out and share with others. This is the time for giving. There are several ways in which you can give. Please choose one of these ways and give as God has prospered you.
now I have the privilege of introducing our speaker for this morning. Uh, he is none other than the Reverend Dr. Robert Michael Franklin Jr. He is President Emeritus of Morehouse College, uh, the former president of ITC, and the current uh, professor uh, in moral leadership at Candler Theology uh, at Emory University. And Dr. Franklin has a very extensive bio, and I won't, I won't read every single detail, um, but just know that he is a man of God who has proven himself in uh, the academic space as well as the sacred church space. He has been impactful in the community um, that has been honored by numerous presidents and community leaders, and he is indebted to pouring into the next generation and generations to follow to continue in work that he is involved in. And the next voice you will hear after the voices of Alua will be the Reverend Dr. Mike, Robert Michael Franklin Jr.
and your mercy toward us. Happy anniversary, Zion Hill. I will bless the Lord at all times, and God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. We give thanks to God this day for this celebration, this virtual celebration, and I am so honored to be back in the house of God in this very special congregation give thanks for this ministry, for the leadership of Pastor Aaron Parker, a man who I realize I've known for 50 years as we were young students at Morehouse College in the early 1970s. But we gather today in the spirit of joy and of gratitude for all that God has done for us despite the challenges we face at this hour. I highlight the scripture that has been identified as the anniversary theme scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. He who rescued us from so deadly a peril will continue to rescue us. On him we have set our hope that he will rescue us again. God add a blessing to the reading of this word. Thanks be to God for the ministry of Zion Hill Baptist Church. For 149 years you have inspired us, guided us, and challenged us to move forward. But what a fascinating pandemic season this has been. Now two years of virtual celebrations of church anniversary, a time when we are practicing, as the pastor lifted up earlier, those public health best practices to remain healthy, those three W's that we all learned of wearing our masks, watching our distance to other, to, between others, and washing our hands. What we have endured has been extraordinary. Global pandemic has taken more than 620,000 American lives and over 4 million lives globally. Mass death, premature mortality. And many of us have lost friends and family, people who have enriched our lives. And so in that posture today, we reflect on their lives and we give thanks to God for them. We miss them even as we lift up in prayer this weekend, those who are struggling in the Republic of Haiti and those who struggle in fear and terror in Afghanistan. Two pandemics have preoccupied us for the past 18 months, the global public health pandemic and a pandemic of racial reckoning. Your pastor has spoken often of these. You all know by now that a hundred years ago, something similar was unfolding in our midst. A hundred years ago, the Tulsa race massacre occurred, and what was called Black Wall Street out in Oklahoma was burned in 1921. 
A young black man, Rich Rowland, was at the center of that tragedy. Who could have predicted 100 years later, 2020, another young black man, George Floyd, was at the center of another great national reckoning as he was murdered on international television. America was perplexed then, 100 years ago. America perplexed now. America was confronted with its two original sins of Indian removal and African enslavement. Then and now, America panicked. America denied. It blamed the victims and changed the subject. Those multiple pandemics, disease, racism, inequality, mob violence, police violence, and others triggered what many scholars have come to call soul injury and soul trauma. And as, that, as if that was not enough, America had the misfortune in both chapters of our history to be led by presidents who were not adequate to the hour. It is almost hard to believe that at a time of pandemic threatening the life of the nation, the person sitting in the White House was inept and incapable of responding adequately. In 1918, it was Woodrow Wilson, and in 2020, a man called Trump. At least President Wilson it served as president of Princeton University before occupying the White House, of course proving that high IQ does not solve for racism, because he was a vicious racist. And president Trump, well, the president of Trump University. We were hurting and needed a word from a trusted authority. Instead, we heard the ramblings of an incompetent. We needed facts but we got foolishness. We needed assurance, but we received uncertainty. We needed to unite to save lives, but instead we were provoked to hate each other, to hate Asians, to hate black lives, to hate those who voted for a different party. Everything this most recent president touched, everything he touched, he made worse. And we held our collective breath each morning, as you recall. He would send a tweet and raise everybody's blood pressure. Soul injury. And so in this unusual hour, we ask, how do we revive hope? How do we sustain hope amidst soul injury and soul trauma? How does Christian faith stand up against the present unspeakable mass horror and death. Even now, I am convicted by the words of a theologian who urged us, and I quote, to say nothing about God that you cannot say in the presence of millions of murdered Africans, millions of murdered Jews, millions of murdered Indians. And so the question of this anniversary season is, how do we revive and sustain hope? Well, Corinthians, that interesting collection of books, they offer uh, an interesting response to the question. What is this book, Corinthians? First and second Corinthians are two letters written by Paul to the church in the city, the ancient city of Corinth. And we know this church had a special place in Paul's life because he wrote a long first letter and then some time passed and then he wrote a second letter. And this did not happen often. Hence, 2 Corinthians. So do you say 2 Corinthians? On the first page of 2 Corinthians, throughout the first chapter, we read of affliction, suffering, consolation. In the middle of the book, affliction, suffering, consolation. At the end of the book, affliction, suffering, consolation. Corinthians was written in a hostile culture, a hostile environment. Go back and read the two books together. 
And you might note that 1 Corinthians was written under a different Roman emperor. We'll say more about this momentarily. But it matters who the leader is. It matters who is leading the nation as the lives of the people go forward. Because leaders set a tone at the top. So it mattered that the leader of the Roman Empire during 2 Corinthians was a man by the name of Nero, Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, better known as Nero. Claudius was the emperor during that first, the writing of 1 Corinthians. But Nero was emotionally damaged. He was immature. He was vicious. And he was paranoid. He ascended to the office at the tender age of 17. He came into office during the year 54 AD, or CE, Christian era, as we refer to it. Recall Jesus had died and was, was away by 33 CE, or 33 AD. Here, 20 years later, 54, Nero enters the Roman Empire, the most powerful government on the earth. And then 2 Corinthians appears in 55 AD, a year after Nero's ascension to office. The content and tone of 2 Corinthians reflects what was happening in the daily life of the church. Nero sent spies to worship in the local churches, and what he learned disturbed him. This was a small group of Jews who were worshiping someone named Jesus. And this Jesus had the audacity to be referred to as a king, king of the Jews. And the people who seemed to worship and remember him talked about his bringing the kingdom of God. Well, this drove Nero crazy. To add drama to this scene, in the year 64 AD, somehow, mysteriously, the city of Rome caught on fire. I hope all of you viewing and listening now will have an opportunity to visit that extraordinary city of Rome, if you have not already. But imagine a great city, one of the greatest city in the world. At that time, three-fourths of it burned to the ground. For six days, for seven nights, Rome burned. And the Senate and the people in the nation began to look to Nero and say, he did it. For we know how disturbed he is. He would set a city, his own city, on fire just to amuse himself and to rebuild it according to his own design. People were out to pin this on Nero. But Nero pinned it on the Christians. He scapegoated Christians, began to torture them. He began a campaign to kill Christians in the most horrific manner for the amusement of the citizens of Rome. He turned it into a game. The ways in which he devised Christians were so devious and ghastly that it even inspired sympathy among the citizens of Rome. Christians being crucified upside down. Christians dipped in petroleum and set on fire and placed along the edges of the world's greatest stadium, Circus Maximus, for the evening games, and those bodies became torches for lighting the evening sky. During this time of crisis, people looked to Paul for hope. And so when you open 2 Corinthians, all that background and the presence of Nero needs to be in mind as you read those words again. They looked to Paul for a word of hope. This must have struck some in Christian circles as a bit unusual, that people would look to Paul for, on the topic of hope. For you see, Paul was the great preacher and theologian of faith, pistis in Greek. This was his reputation, recall his epic declarations, on faith. By grace are you saved through faith. But since we are justified by faith, on and on, Paul wrote about faith. He loved to talk about faith. Theologians, ancient and modern, looked to Paul from Augustine and to Martin Luther and found in Paul towering monuments to the nature of 
faith, that unique way of seeing and construing reality. To be sure, Christians in the Roman, under, Roman Empire under Nero, they had faith, but they needed something more at this time of persecution. They were oppressed and afraid. They were uncertain. They were suffering. Their faith had landed them in trouble. And they must have wondered, how long, Lord? How long must we endure this for our faith? Many of you listening now, viewing now, you know something about this existential complexity. You're trying your best to build up a family, build a community, build an organization, and everybody around you is trying to tear it down. How long, Lord? You know what it's like to sacrifice and give your best only to have it taken for granted or overlooked. You know something about training other folk to do a job so that they can replace you. You know about folk mistreating you and getting an attitude when you protest and resist. How long, Lord? How long? Lord, we've got faith, but what are we supposed to do with the soul injury and the soul trauma? And that's when Paul spoke up. The great voice of faith, the great theologian of faith began to reflect on hope. Listen again to your anniversary scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. He who rescued us from so deadly a peril will continue to rescue us. On him we have set our hope that he will rescue us again. Paul shifted from faith to hope. Whereas faith focuses on the right now, hope is directed toward the future. Where faith is a very present substance of things hoped for, hope is the future state of affairs. One philosopher, Edmund Husserl, said that hope is directed intentionality. What are you hoping for today? On this anniversary Sunday, we ask, how do we revive hope during difficult times? How do we sustain hope amidst soul injury and soul trauma? Well, God's word tells us the one who rescued you before is worthy of your trust now. We don't know what this COVID-19 will do in the future, but set your hope on God, for God will rescue us again. But let me highlight two pieces of wisdom about hope, one modern, one old school. You know, the best definition I have found of, of, of theolo theology is that theology is faith seeking understanding faith seeking understanding. And so when Time Magazine poured over the expanse of the 20th century and asked the question, who was the greatest theologian of the 20th century? They offered an interesting response. They declared it was a man by the name of Carl Paul Reinhold Niebuhr, N-I-E-B-U-H-R. Niebuhr lived from 1892 to 1971. Now such claims about who was the greatest theologian, faith-seeking understanding, who's the greatest at that in the 20th century, that's a controversial claim. And many rose up to challenge that claim. I remember when James Cone, the great black liberation theologian, when Jacqueline Grant of ITC said, well, Niebuhr was brilliant, but he didn't speak out. He didn't call out white supremacy or the oppression of women sufficiently for a Christian disciple. But it is certain that Reinhold Niebuhr was one of the most influential Christian theologians of the ages. From Martin Luther King Jr. to Jimmy Carter, from Barack Obama to FBI Director Comey, they all read Niebuhr, and they testified to his influence in their lives. 
Niebuhr was an American born in the Midwest to a German family. He pastored a church in the Detroit area. He observed racial oppression and was disturbed about it. In time, he left the church. He became a theologian. Niebuhr looked at the Nazis in Germany. He looked at the Ku Klux Klan in Georgia and concluded that people are more likely to sin as members of groups than as individuals. Think January 6th. He wrote his most famous book, Moral Man and Immoral Society, during those years. Niebuhr saw that Americans preferred to wrap themselves in the flag of patriotism rather than confront their original sins of Indian genocide and African enslavement. Niebuhr said that power must be balanced by power, and the greatest power of oppressed people is their non-cooperation with evil. The greatest power of poor, oppressed people is their resistance to evil. And then he shared this gem of wisdom. How do we revive hope? Niebuhr wrote, and I quote, nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or good or beautiful makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. And no act, nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. Faith, hope, love. You see Niebuhr working with those triplets of the theological virtues in 1 Corinthians 13 that Paul wrote about. Three things remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Nothing worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime, in one lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. We will not live forever, but the good you do will be a lasting blessing on your name. And so go on and plant those trees, even though you may not sit under them and enjoy their shade. But, as my friend, theologian Greg Ellison says, we all sit under trees that other folk planted for us. Future generations will bless you. But with all of his genius, Reinhold Niebuhr wrote many books, but his greatest contribution was just a tiny little prayer. In 1937, he was trying to revive the hope of people struggling to make sense out of suffering. He was thinking about their afflictions, and he wrote these words. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Came, as you know, came to be known as the serenity prayer. Organizations throughout the world began to embrace this serenity prayer as their motto. Even Alcoholics Anonymous and other 12-step programs had people reciting Reinhold Niebuhr's little serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Maybe today, if you're sitting there, you're feeling a bit of soul injury and trauma, or you're trying to work up the courage to face a big decision coming this week, maybe you ought to whisper that serenity prayer. So that's one piece of wisdom from one of our greatest theologians, the serenity prayer. But the other comes from James Weldon Johnson. Ah, you know that name, author of Lift Every Voice and Sing. He wrote those words in 1900 but they didn't become a song for another five years. 1905, and who did it? His brother, Rosamond Johnson, came along and put the lyrics to music. These musicians know about that. You have an inspiration, you got the poetry, but you don't have the music. Or sometimes the music comes first and the poetry, the language comes out. Two brothers put it together and here we had suddenly lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. He was writing a poem, a tribute to Abraham Lincoln, who had been killed, as you know, as a president who took certain stances to dismantle slavery. 
and he wanted to inspire America and other white Christians to show more courage in identifying and standing with black folk who were oppressed. Sing a song full of faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. And so as we face the challenges of today and tomorrow, as we seek to revive our hope, thanks be to God, we have this word of God, and we have a prayer and a song. May God bless you today in your struggles, your pains, your doubts. I don't know what you're struggling with today. I just know that you have some struggles. But you need to figure out the song and the prayer that recharges your battery. Find a song full of hope, a prayer and a song. That may not sound like much to some of you, but that's all Paul and Silas had when they were sitting in prison. You can imagine them thinking, Lord, we don't know how long this crazy emperor is going to torture and persecute us, but we trust God to rescue us, so we'll just keep on singing and keep on praying. Go back and look at Acts chapter 16, where it describes they kept singing and kept praying, and pretty soon an earthquake came and opened the doors of the prison. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I can hear our ancestors struggling, coming out of slavery, singing those songs of faith and hope. And sometimes all they had was a prayer and a song, but in time, the chains of slavery fell off and Juneteenth finally came. And they stood up and sang, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Harriet Tubman had a prayer and a song as she led scores of slaves to freedom. Faith and hope, a prayer and a song, they were her foundation. She added a shotgun to the mix a little later, but she had prayer and a song, and she led the people out and handed them over to Booker T. Washington who taught those HBCU students to build their own dormitories, to build their own colleges. And they sang together through many dangers, toils, and snares. We have already come. It was grace that brought us safe this far, and grace will lead us home. A prayer and a song will revive hope. That's what you proved to us, Zion Hill. That's why you've been here for 149 years. I know you've had many tears and sorrows. You've had questions for tomorrow. There's been times when you didn't know right from wrong, but in every situation, God gave you blessed consolation. That God gave you consolation that our trials come to make us strong. Through it all, through it all, we've learned to trust in Jesus and we've learned to trust in God. Paul wrote, we are afflicted on every side, but not crushed. That's the theology of 2 Corinthians. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Oh, I've seen the lightning flash, and I've heard the thunder roll, and I felt sin breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. But I've heard the voice of Jesus saying, still fight on. He promised never to leave us, never to leave us alone. A prayer and a song will revive your hope today. God bless you. Oh, praise the Lord, my brothers and sisters. We have had our hope revived today. And we want to offer you now an opportunity to anchor your hope in this God who never, ever, ever, ever fails. 
if you are willing to do that today, if you are ready to do that, if you have been moved on this occasion, we invite you to Christian discipleship. Wherever you are, no matter where you are in this nation or even in this world, if you are ready to turn your life over to God, this, this God in whom you can place your ultimate hope, we invite you to do so right now. Maybe you're just looking for a, 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 a Christian home, a place where you can share with other brothers and sisters who are ready to uh, move forward in God. We invite you to come and share with us as well. Allow us to be a part of your coming. Give us a call. Send us a note and we will be glad to share with you your coming into this blessed and blissful hope. Won't you come now? just a few years ago here at Zion Hill. And we simply call it the ringing of the bell. And every anniversary, we now ring an old bell that was actually purchased by the church all the way back when the church existed on McDaniel Street. Oh, that's been more than 60, 70 years ago. But that was a tradition about this bell that every morning as church was about to start, this bell would be rung throughout the community. People would hear it. And they would know that it was time to come in and worship and praise God in remembrance of those brothers and sisters who were with us decades and decades ago. Many of them, most of them, have actually gone home to be with the Lord. 
but we now come to you and share this time of the ringing of the bell. We will ring it one time for 100 years, four times for 40 years, and then we will ring it nine times for the nine years, 149 years. Let us remember our ancestors. Yes, my brothers and sisters, 149 years. This has been a glorious experience. We will come to you, come back to you just a little bit later. And again, we want to urge you to stay all the way until the benediction. But at this time, uh, coming to us just with, with a few final remarks will be Minister Jairus Hallam's who for the second year came and served, willingly served, ably served, I might add, as chair of our church anniversary. Mr. Hallams will come, I will come back to you in order to give closing remarks. Minister Hallam. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Uh, thank you, Zion Hill, for allowing me to serve as your chairperson a second time. I want to thank the committee uh, who couldn't be here, but thank you. I appreciate you and I appreciate all of your ideas and your encouragement and your persistence and your wonderfulness. And I'm not just saying that. Uh, so thank you. I appreciate Elder LaShawn Chandler, you, you the best, uh, and Sister Gloria, and to the many ministries that were involved in this weekend. Uh, to help us put on the wonderful parade and the service this morning, the administrative and the office staff, the beautification ministry, the courtesy guild, culinary ministry, the culinary ministry, the culinary ministry, the culinary ministry is the best of the best. I tell you the truth. Um, to the deacons and trustees, thank you. To facilities, my goodness. Uh, to finance, to the history committee, to the media ministry, thank you to the mighty men for the ringing of the bell, as well as helping us with the parade yesterday, uh, to the music ministry, uh, to photography and security, the Timothy Bird Usher ministry, the, everybody, just, just everybody. Thank you for your excellence. And we are grateful that you were able to help us celebrate our 149th church anniversary. Indeed, brothers and sisters, once again, we want to add our word of gratitude to all of those brothers and sisters who shared in this wonderful occasion. This, brothers and sisters, has been a fabulous occasion. And some people ask, well, why did you ask Mr. Hallams to come back and do this again? That's because he is the only person in Zion Hill who had any experience whatsoever of doing a church anniversary in a pandemic. And that's why we asked him to come back and do it a second time this year. And indeed, uh, he did an outstanding job. He, along with his entire committee, and um, let me just call the names of those people since they are not going to be able to be here. Sister Gwendolyn Buchanan, Sister Deborah Chambers, 
Minister Felicia Chisholm, Deacon Marilyn Cruda, Sister Kathy Fluellen, uh, Minister Jairus Hallams, of course, who served as chair here, uh, Sister Felicia Hill, Minister Kathy Nealon, Sister Liz Rico, uh, Sister Marie Lico, uh, Sister Kimberly Smith, uh, Elder LaShawn Chandler, Sister Gloria Williams. We continue, brothers and sisters, he's mentioned all of the other uh, Zion Hill ministries that have uh, come together and, and helped in this wonderful and glorious occasion. And we are tremendously grateful to each and every one of you. I know that all of you who came out on yesterday, who had an opportunity to share in the parade, we are going to announce a winner for the decoration of your cars within the next week or so. So hold on, hold on. Our judges uh, are looking at uh, all of the pictures that we have taken and you will be notified. You will be notified. And we will let you see who actually won the decorating parade contest. Certainly, brothers and sisters, we were moved and stirred and informed, enlightened and inspired by our powerful message that we heard from our speaker today, the Reverend Dr. Robert Michael Franklin. We praise God for him right now. Certainly a consummate scholar, but not only that, a man of God who it has his his hand on the pulse, has his hands on the pulse of liberating activity throughout the world. And we are grateful. Indeed, Zion Hill, we are tremendously blessed to have him to share with us. Uh, he told you that we have been knowing each other for a long, 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 long time. We were only kids when we basically first uh, knew each other but he was going around here telling our age. But that's all right, we are glad to be the age that we are and still able to do something on behalf of God. But again, we thank him for his insightful and stirring message on today. God bless you and God keep you. This is our prayer. Again, I wanna remind you, those of you who did not pick up your dinner on yesterday, we do have some dinners that you can come and get today. We will start sharply at 12 noon. Uh, you will have time to listen to the close of the message and then get in your vehicle and come out. But 12 noon, we will start promptly and we will close promptly at 12.30. So come and get your meal. We will give them out as long as we have them. So please come and share. This is our hope and prayer. My brothers and sisters, it's been 149 years. Some ups and some downs. Some ins and some outs. But brothers and sisters, you know what? We can say still. We are still here. So as we look forward now, closing out 149, we start on this day, looking forward to 150 years of existence to pull us into that future, to push us forward. We just want to share this moment of inspiration with you. Won't you share now as we look forward to 150 years?
Yes, our theme for the 150th church anniversary, still, still, still. All the things we've been through, still. Ups, downs, ins, outs, still, still. We look forward, brothers and sisters, to sharing with you all. And now, won't you receive these parting words? God, we thank you for this day, for blessings that you permitted us to share, not only during this weekend, but throughout these 149 years. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your kindness. We, we thank you, God, for rebounding ability. We thank you, God, that our hope didn't die, that we still trust in you. Sometimes, God, it, it, it got extremely difficult and, and we wondered whether we would make it. But God, through your grace and through your mercy, you permitted us as a community to keep going. And so God, we bring with us the spirit of all of those brothers and sisters who are now in your blessed and blissful presence. God, continue to go with us. We need you. We trust you. We believe in you. We understand, God, that because you've kept us before, we have every reason to hope that you will continue to keep us. We bless you. We praise you. We honor you. And now, may God bless you and keep you. May God make divine face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. May our God lift up countenance upon you and give you and yours sustaining and everlasting peace. Let us all respond. Amen.